live. This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show that you're tuned into. Again, we're here Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern Time. Check us out on Revolution Radio Network. Dot com. Of course, that's 12 to 3 Pacific. You can also listen to us on Tape Delay in Wisconsin on uh, Madison's 92.7 FM. And, uh, of course, that's 7 to 10 Central Time on replay of the Jeff Santos Show. And, again, you can listen to replays of the program podcast beginning at 6.30 Eastern uh, right there at RevolutionRadioNetwork.com. Our next guest comes to us from the great 206, the great city of Seattle, which has given us uh, the first minimum wage of $15 an hour, technically SeaTac, uh, the city with the airport and so forth. Uh, then, of course, you have... Um, the uh, first state, really, along with Colorado, do the marijuana stuff. It is a uh, it is a progressive city. It is a city that uh, dominates the uh, the great state of Washington, which has some you know right wingers there in the eastern part of the of the state. Uh, but we have our Renaissance man. Uh, he's got his uh, eye on the prize on a number of things to talk about, and uh, we're going to do that right now when we talk to Mark. Taylor Canfield, the Renaissance Man of the Jeff Santo Show. MTC, how you doing this Friday, my friend? This boss man who don't need any more wars. I'm in. I'm back in the studio after dealing with a heat wave, so it's kind of nice. Uh, also, there you go. I uh, performed at Art Walk last night at my friend Jose Rodriguez's amazing gallery in Pioneer Square, so it's great to see people coming out again in Seattle. The music venues are starting to open up again, and uh, I think, you know, the show box is opening up this month, Jeff, so I think we're going to see some great Seattle music with a lot of local fans taking the stage, so I'm excited, Um, but I, I am thinking, you know, we are coming up on July 4th, and we should all be thinking about what democracy means and about what this country means. And this whole issue that you were talking about with Joe Sandberg, which is just so pertinent and right on um, the fact that there's so much greed and corruption that's actually holding us back from being the country that we really could be. And, you know, of course, mass homelessness is is an issue here in Seattle as well. And um, during this heat wave, that's been a major uh, concern. So, yeah, we've got good things happening in Seattle. And like everybody else in the country, we also have this um, economic uh problem where apparently there's not enough political clout and uh, or enough political will to actually take on these issues right now because you have such an intransigent uh, party in the U.S. Congress that's holding everything back, and that's happening all across the country. Uh, we got our congressperson, my friend, Pramila Jayapal, taking on some of the biggest employers in Seattle, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, with their antitrust legislation, which got through the the Judiciary Committee in the House, so we'll see what happens with that bill, but I mean, at least she's trying to do something to take on some of these issues that are at a crisis point in our history as a country, and I think we all need to be thinking about this stuff as we go into July 4th. It's, what is this country, uh, what do we stand for, and definitely, what can we do better on, and mass homelessness is and um, raising the minimum wage are two things that can definitely uh, affect people's daily lives in any major city in the United States, and we have to take that on directly. So I wish Joe Sandberg, even though I like Governor Inslee, I wish Joe Sandberg would run for governor in Washington State. I wish he was living here, because <laughs> yeah. we need to hear people like him, and we need to hear yeah. people like Jayapal just take on these issues directly without all that usual mealy mouth neoliberal nonsense you know, that we've been hearing for years from the Democrats, and then the crazy right-wing hatred coming from the Republicans, which doesn't help anything. Talking with the great MTC here, I want to get into, into Jayapal because, and we're going to talk to Rudy in Chicago, who's, who's concerned about some of the issues he just spoke about with the homeless. I must tell you, I think that Jayapal, and you've been talking to me about her for five years, as you have about Ms. Swant, the city councilor there. I think people need to know about how she came into politics and, you know, has become a major, the leading figure. You know, AOC may get more publicity, and she deserves to be that person. She's outspoken. She is more in your face than, say, Jayapal is. It's a different personality set. Um, and, and, you know, and there are others, too, others in the squad, Omar and Talib. But I think that there 
is something special with Jayapal that she's been able to put the pressure on Pelosi, who has come out and said, make it very clear to Schumer and Biden, unless you do the budget reconciliation bill simultaneously, and for those who don't know the definition, that means, uh, you know, at the same time with the uh, BS bipartisan bill that Mr. Uh, Biden was touting the other day in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, red state Wisconsin, that part of the state anyways, and this is an important piece of the puzzle. So, Mark, you've been covering her for a long time, even before she ran for Congress. Give us a little background about Jayapal, because we don't hear that from the national media. Again, you're there in the 206. Well, I've known Pramila for years. Uh, as I mentioned to you, when I first met her, she was on a bullhorn at a protest. And was... Uh, speaking out for immigrants' rights at an INS detention center. And my thought at the time when I was hearing her speak was, this woman is on fire, she's got so much passion, having been born herself in India and then moved here as a young woman, um, she knows what it's like to be an immigrant and to struggle. Um, But I I was thinking at the time, Jeff, that, you know, she's just too radical to ever run for office. That was exactly my thought. So the fact that she's become my representative in the U.S. Congress is kind of mind-blowing, plus the fact that she's taken over for uh, a a position that Jim McDermott had for 14 terms before he finally retired. Another, you know, guy that I've hung out with, good guy. All of a sudden, I realized the reason that Pelosi and the Democrats have to give her her creds as a sophomore congressperson now, I mean, but she was even getting attention as a freshman. The reason that they have to give her a platform is because she wins her re-election with 80% of the vote, and we know that that's going to continue. Uh, same thing with Jim McDermott, just incredible numbers here in Seattle. People really love her. She is the true progressive fighter that we all want as a representative in Congress. And, you know, regardless of how, you know, what people think of her personal style, I mean, she has brought home the bacon for us. She brought home millions of dollars in infrastructure, so she's not just out there fighting uh, on and issues that might be uh, termed radical or progressive, she's actually out there just doing what a good congressperson is supposed to do. Also, I think that the fact that she's got such a safe seat just makes her, you know, she's always going to be a thorn in the side in the Democrats' uh, establishment, in the corporate establishment there. Yeah. They can't get yeah. rid of her. She's going to get reelected every time. They might as well give her a platform and support her because at least they know that in that district, <laughs> they, they've got it all wrapped up, and they don't, they don't even need to spend money in Seattle. Nobody runs against her. <laughs> you know, why would you when you know that she's going right, to get exactly. percent of the vote? Right, no, yeah. it's, so it's a perfect incredible. point. It is a district that is very progressive. Uh, the people of Seattle are progressive as any city in the entire country. Uh, for that matter, you can include North America in there, too, uh, with your friends to the north there in Vancouver uh, and the world of Cascadia. And I really feel that um, she's going to be a key, key person. If, if you're going to be able to get the filibuster uh, done, uh, her work pushing Pelosi, uh, we talked about it earlier that, you know, Pelosi is not going to go ahead and allow the situation uh, to deteriorate where they you know, they sell out to, to the Republicans and to get 10 votes. And, of course, that will not uh, be 10 votes. McConnell will pull somebody aside and say, if you do that, you're gone, uh, and we'll primary you in, in you know, whatever, or we'll take your funds away from your pension, whatever. He plays hardball. That's the way McConnell works. That's how the Republicans work in the 21st century. So uh, Jayapal probably went to Pelosi and said, look, i got 100 votes here. You don't have them. I have them, and you don't go ahead and uh, and allow Joe Biden to roll you uh, because we're not going to vote for it. So it's you know it's dead on arrival. So you better make sure they're simultaneous. And I think that he does it in a way, maybe not as confrontational as as you or I or even as AOC would be, but it doesn't always have to work. You know, in that direction, you don't always have to have a food fight. You don't always have to have somebody screaming like I am. Uh, You can do it behind the scenes. And, you know, Joe Biden does that. The problem is, is that Joe Biden, unlike Jayapal, is not fighting 
every day on a progressive direction. That's the distinction. I don't yeah. mind somebody who does it behind the scenes, but the intention is is to push the agenda. Mr. Biden is always, you know, take 10% and go home and you call it a victory. That's not how the, yeah. the world works. And I think that's, that's sort of a, a little bit of uh, how I see uh, Jaya Paul from 3,000 miles away. You've got to look at what she's actually accomplishing. And one of the things, you know, I'll quote our friend Jim Bruner from the Seattle Times. He's been a reporter here at the Seattle Times forever. Uh, quote, as a general rule, politicians don't pick fights with their state's biggest private employers. But Seattle Congresswoman Camilla Jayapal is doing just that, sponsoring legislation that would break up Amazon. I mean, that's out of that, that's something that nobody else has tried to do. But uh, we've seen these antitrust suits against Microsoft and Amazon. And in Europe, the EU is, you know, not, not really down for this monopoly of every market. So here in the United States, she has finally got her sponsored legislation passed through the House Judiciary Committee. And it ca- it's taking on the four biggest tech giants, which is Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Google. And it's called the Ending Platform Monopolies Act. And it followed up after a 16-month antitrust investigation that they completed last in the fall, and uh, House just recently unveiled five antitrust bills trying to check the power of these companies by limiting their ability to gobble up or hamstring competitors. It is a good article. I, you know, I'm, I'm not getting paid to say this, but Jim Bruner has got a good article in the Seattle Times on this very issue where he goes into depth. She's a vice chair of the House's antitrust subcommittee, and she's saying that big companies can't be trusted to police themselves and that even beefed up federal regulations isn't sufficient. And that's why she thinks the breakups are necessary. And she says, look, this isn't about Amazon. It's about the monopoly powers of the big four tech companies. It's an irresistible urge for companies that are operating on multiple platforms with conflicts of interest and competing business to use power in ways that will suppress competition. And that's what the EU has been saying, right? Uh, For years about Microsoft and now about Amazon. Once again, what do we want to represent as a country on July 4th? We want to represent multinational corporations that control the entire market and the economy of our country and our government? Or do we want to be independent and support the small startups and the mom and pop shops and the family businesses that have kept our cities alive all these years? Personally, I chose the latter. That's what anybody who has a heart, who has a soul, would do. And, and of course, you do, Mark. Uh, you're an activist and advocate on your own hand, besides being an excellent journalist and uh, superb musician. Well, if you don't mind, I have a breaking story, so I don't know if you've known, but uh, Richardson has been banned from the Olympics because she tested positive for marijuana. So if you yes, want to talk about that. another issue that right. we um, have been sort of a forerunner on oh, yeah. uh, Pramila Jayapal just tweeted out that marijuana should be legalized. And this is bringing up an issue on all of the major media platforms today. So you can imagine um, how it's going to change the dialogue in the media about cannabis. But uh, it's one of those stories that I was telling people has legs. So don't yeah. expect uh, that movement across the country to stop there. The movement towards legalization of marijuana is not going away. And then I wanted to mention something really quick, too, if you don't mind. You, you guys were mentioning minimum wage before, which is something that started here in SeaTac, Washington, and then was championed by our Democratic Social City Council member, Shama Sawant, and, and Seattle was the first major city in the country to adopt it. Uh, now it's a national campaign. It's been that way for a long time. A lot of major labor unions at the SEIU have picked it up and run with it. But I wanted to let people know that there is a, uh, a locally there is a locally owned uh, chain here of restaurants, drive-ins is what they are, and they're sort of based on the old-style 1950s just drive-through. A lot of them are actually walk-up, where you park, but then you walk up to the counter. Some of them have indoor seating, some don't. Some are just, you know, a stand. But they're called Dick's Drive-In, and they've been around since the 50s, and everyone loves them and supports them. One, because they are a locally owned business. Two, because they've always given their employees uh, $15 an hour or above. I believe that the wage is more like 18 or something. They also get major medical and dental benefits. They also can apply for scholarships uh, to continue their education. And they get paid to volunteer for community groups around the city. So you know what? I would say uh, if 
Dick's Drive-In, which is a locally owned uh, chain of uh, drive-ins, can do that, then major employers like McDonald's that make billions of dollars a year um, can certainly afford to pay their employees a, a livable wage. And that would be one of the things that would go towards solving the houseless problem that people are having, where you have to you know, um, rely on subsidized housing and things like that. So I don't think that's going to go away either. I think we need more subsidized housing in this country. We need more rent control. We need more ways for average working people to survive. So you've got to increase their wages, and you just can't keep letting... And this is not a political philosophy. This is just common sense. You can't yeah. just let the top 1.5% or 5.5% take all of the money. I mean, it's fine for people to be wealthy if they want to be wealthy. But you know what I'm saying? Um, you have to be responsible for the community you live in. And you can't just wall yourself off and pretend that you don't notice. So all of these billionaires that live in Seattle, and these, uh, you know, and there's a lot of them here, they need to really recognize that they need to contribute to the solution to these social problems in their own communities and just stop trying to make money with no sense of responsibility for the people they're affecting. So I just had to throw that out there. Sorry, I don't mean to get on the soapbox. Well, it's, it's very important. If they can do it there, they can do it everywhere. And again, $15 yeah. minimum wage, something that Joe Sandberg, uh, who we just spoke to, has been a big advocate for, uh, actually even more so, at $25 an hour. I just keep um, you know, asking folks to look at the, a whole, the whole picture here because um, climate and economics and environmental and social and civil justice and equality all are kind of tied together. And it's important that we think as a nation that, um, we ha that we can solve these problems, that there are solutions, and that you know, we, have some, we have brilliant scientists, we have um, some brilliant people, uh, in our universities and even and in private corporations who can apply a lot of new technologies and new ways of doing things. you got a lot of younger folks coming up through academia and, and as I've, I was speaking about in, before, in journalism, um, trying to change the way that we think about um, the future of our country and, uh, and taking care of, you know, the place we live. So we're all very aware um, in Seattle that... Um, the environment is a very important part of our daily lives, and I think we've also tried to lead the nation at times. Um, you mentioned, I, I wasn't you actually, but or, or somebody mentioned the tar sand oil, um, and that's another issue because not only Lake Superior, but they want to increase the shipping, uh, the tanker runs across Puget Sound um, by a big percentage too, and that's one of the reasons I was out there on the Greenpeace ship, the Arctic Sunrise, for a week following potential tanker routes to see where the potential spills might happen. So, yeah, you know, Alberta's tar sand oil. Well, I think that was our good friend John, uh, who we'll get to in, in a second here, uh, brought it up from Minneapolis. And by the way, thank you, Rudy, for all of this. Appreciate it very much. Have yourself a great, happy uh, Fourth of July weekend, uh, and thank you for fighting for this country, too. Oh, yeah, well, I just want to say that people are coming back in Seattle to the – the art shows so it was really a pleasure once again to see that people are out in pioneer square in seattle not to be confused with pioneer square in portland which is also a really vibrant place but it's the old town of seattle where the original buildings from the 1800s are still standing which is hard to find in seattle believe me because everything has been so overdeveloped um but yeah my friend jose rodriguez uh Garris, uh art gallery had a, had a show where i got to play the baby grand piano and uh, my own classical and jazz stuff, and then our friend Sid uh, Span played in front of this huge mural of Jimi Hendrix, so it was a very Seattle moment. Uh, luckily, I got to document some of it by interviewing people and filming it, too, so I was sort of wearing two hats, uh, performing, but also trying to uh, be a journalist and cover some of this really vital art and culture in Seattle that is surviving even through this corporate stuff. I met a lot of people last night from different parts of the country and around the world and, you know, they're in Seattle and they're saying, hey, Mark, what is going up with this town? And the truth is that there's still a lot of really interesting underground music and art that's happening. It's never been a place like L.A. Uh, necessarily where everything is overhyped and you'll, you'll know exactly where the best bands are. You kind of have to get to know people and find them on your own. Yeah. That is why, uh, you know, we talk to you because, uh, you know, you, you go underground and, and that's the great thing. That's what, you know, that's what uh, the whole Nirvana grunge movement was about. You know, it's underground and it percolated up and, you know, transformed the American music scene. Hey, we've got to run, my friend. Have yourself a great weekend, Mark Taylor Canfield. Happy Fourth of July. 
Uh, enjoy it. Rock on. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Mark. Rock on. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ron Carter for producing this broadcast. Thank you for tuning in, folks. Have yourself a uh, wonderful weekend. We'll be off on Monday, back on Tuesday. Keep on fighting peacefully. Enjoy it, folks. My name is Jeff Santos, and right now it is my time to say I got to go. The Jeff Santos Show is heard every weekday on this station between 3 and 6 p.m. To listen to podcasts of The Jeff Santos Show, go to revolutionradionetwork.com. With SRN News, I'm Keith Peters in Washington. Defense officials say the last U.S. and NATO forces have left Afghanistan's Bagram Air Base the center of the war against militants for some 20 years. Bagram Air Base, not far from the capital, Kabul, was a symbol of America's military strength in Afghanistan. At the peak of the U.S.-led war in the country, thousands of foreign troops were stationed there. A bustling city grew around the air base. All foreign troops leaving Bagram is a significant milestone in the end of international military operations in Afghanistan. As foreign militaries leave, violence in the country is worsening. BBC correspondent Yogita LeMay reporting from Kabul. The death toll is now 20 in that Florida condominium collapse, though the number of missing has dropped from 145 to 128. Officials said that the number declined after duplicate names were eliminated and some residents reported missing turned up safe. The recovery of two bodies included that of a 7-year-old daughter of a Miami firefighter. City of Miami Mayor Francis Suarez says the tragedy has haunted so many of them. So many of us have know someone who has been uh, in the building or affected by this tragedy and so now uh, not only do we know someone this is someone that's a member of our of our family of our fire families AAA says more than 47 million Americans will take to the nation's roadways this Independence Day as travel volumes are expected to nearly fully recover to pre-pandemic levels spokesman Andrew Gross says if you're planning to leave later today on your holiday weekend trip expect to see plenty of traffic on the road people should be expecting that the empty roads of the past year are kind of over they, if you choose to leave like on a Thursday afternoon or a Friday afternoon which is the time we recommend you don't leave but if you do you will be facing traffic jams on, around major metropolitan areas and this is SRN news live is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. It is hour three of the Jeff Santos Show, and welcome to it, folks. Coming to you live from the South Coast here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, we're going to be uh, going west for the entire hour. Uh, the bottom of the hour, we'll talk to uh, Seattle-based uh, journalist, Renaissance man Joe, uh, our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield. But we'll start the hour with our good friend, uh, again, the co-founder of Aspiration.com, uh, hopefully a candidate for governor in 2022 in the great golden state of California. Our good friend Joe Sandberg uh, starts us off in this hour three of the uh, Jeff Santo show. Uh, Joe, great to have you back on the program. Happy Fourth of July weekend. I uh, hope you're having a good Friday. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. Awesome. Uh, great to have you on. Well, we got lots to talk about, and we were uh, discussing with uh, your good friend and mine, Harvey K, about the, the concern, uh, which is something we talk about every week, but I want to spend a little bit more time than usual on the homeless crisis uh, that has uh, engulfed, and I think that may be the most appropriate word, uh, the second largest city in America, Los Angeles. And um, if you think about it, um, and obviously, people, as as Harvey and I were talking about, you know, come from different parts of the country uh, to warm spots, whether it's California or Florida. Um, and you know, we obviously have to look back at the 1970s with Ronald Reagan, uh, who uh, basically released people uh, from uh, institutions of uh, mental health into the streets, uh, and and that started. But it's been on both sides of the political aisle uh, that uh, people are suffering. Uh, we mentioned vets and so forth and so on. I've always asked you about this, um, but I want to give you some time here to really focus
focus on this issue because if if California can get this right, it can be it can be sort of how you know the hula hoop and the car, uh, the convertible spread across America. Uh, if it doesn't get right, then I think the rest of the country, unfortunately, tragically, uh, will look as one of our callers, Peter said, uh, California will turn into Jamaica. You'll have all the resorts in the uh, gated communities in L.A. and Malibu and uh, and and in uh, Pacific Palisades and all these great places and uh, Monterey uh, that you go to, and then the rest of the place is unfortunately, uh, you know, a a 20th century inner city ghetto, um, and uh, the 21st century. Th- that to me can't happen. So your thoughts on where where things need to go uh, and where it is presently for those folks that don't live in Los Angeles or don't watch the local news every day? Well, a new dimension I want to introduce is corruption. We don't talk about this enough, yes. but it's a major factor in the ongoing homelessness crisis. If there's a lot of money that's being spent on homelessness. And if you were to take the amount in the Los Angeles City budget for homelessness, which is almost a billion dollars, and divide it by the number of people who are experiencing homelessness in any given time, you would come up with an amount per person that you'd think would give you plenty to house that person. And so it ultimately begs the question that the media needs to ask more. Show me the money. Mm -hmm. Where is the money going? Now, I'm all for raising taxes and putting more money into it. But we also need to know where, where the heck is the current money going? I have to catch myself because I know I can't. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's a I understand. It's an issue, and the outcome is obscene. Where's the money going? It's a corruption issue. It is a corruption issue, and it's, there's corruption. It's across our politics. You know, I did a thread that really resonated on Twitter about this very question of corruption. You know, the economic and political elites look down on all of us for thinking that working hard and playing by the rules is the way to get ahead. Well, they flop the rules and break the law. They get fined by regulators, and they're rewarded by taking their companies public and becoming billionaires. You look at the issues that we want solved. More than two out of three people want universal health insurance, yet we get no action from states or from the federal government because the health insurance companies shower everyone with campaign donations. And then... Since you and I last talked, news broke around how these oil executives are flat out bribing elected officials. Yes. So while well, a super majority of people want climate action, oil executives shower money on elected officials. We have no climate action. It's not a coincidence. It's flat out corruption. And I'm sure that that common thread extends into why we're not seeing more progress on the question of homelessness. We're putting up almost a billion dollars a year in Los Angeles. Yet the problem is getting worse and worse perceptively by your own two eyes. Anyone can drive around Los Angeles and see it's worse every month. And so I think when we finally get to the bottom of this, we're going to find that somewhere along the road is paved a ton of corruption. Talking with the, uh, the great Joe Sandberg, again, folks, uh, yours truly uh, has had a chance to talk to uh, a number of people who are thinking of running for office, who have been in office. Um, Many of you know that uh, I'm a very good fan of uh, Governor Michael Dukakis, uh, who has been a a friend to me for many, many years. Um, He is one of the rare people who have served in government for quite a long time and has done a good job. Unfortunately, tragically, um, many people who serve in in office uh, end up being corrupt, corrupted by big money, corrupted by uh, a tremendous amount of lobbying power. Uh, Now, that doesn't happen just in D.C. That happens in Sacramento, uh, the California capital, uh, where we've seen, you know, corruption after corruption from uh, governors, Democrat and Republican. You know, you you can go back, uh, you know, to the the 1970s, uh, from Reagan on, you know, through Jerry Brown, uh, through uh, Duke Mason, you know, through uh, all of these folks that have uh, been there. Uh, Pete Wilson, you know, you know, of 187 fame. You go on and on and on. And fact that, you know, you had uh, the Speaker of the, uh, of the Assembly 
you know, basically had to put up a last second, you know, BS thing to stop single payer health care from going through under Jerry Brown, which, of course, he blamed later on there. Uh, and now we have uh, a similar scenario uh, just on the health care issue with Gavin Newsom. So all these things that go on and, of course, health care is a big part of why people are homeless. And you know, that all goes into it with the public housing costs, with the cost of housing in general. I mean, you, you got to be. I lived in San Francisco, Joe. Jeff, in I want to nineteen. Ask you, what's yeah. the number one donor to Gavin Newsom's campaigns? The health insurance industry. Here you the go. The number one donor. If you want to understand why we don't have universal health insurance in California, there's a simple answer. The number one source of his campaign donations is the health insurance industry. Period. End of story. I just need to need to be very clear on that. Uh, as I was saying, in the 1990s, I lived in a two-bedroom apartment in, in downtown San Francisco. I was paying uh, $2,300 uh, with a girlfriend at the time. $2,300. That's probably worth now four grand. How do people in the great city of San Francisco can even afford more than, than cardboard? I mean, it's just ridiculous. And I know the costs of, uh, are very similar in Los Angeles. So you, you cannot have a democracy when only only a handful of people, the top 2% maybe, can actually afford to live. And that's not even buying a, a place. That's renting in, in, in great cities like L.A. and San Francisco, which unfortunately have become uh, a haven for, for the top 2%. It is, it's just incredible. We have a lot of phone uh, calls. People want to talk to you, Joe, about this, including some who live in California. I, I just think that we're at a point now where we got to start naming names. I mean, you, you're right. There was an article uh, published, I, I think it was um, in Current Events, uh, or uh, no, in Common Dreams, uh, that uh, that talked about uh, Joe Manchin and, and Coons, or of course, the former chief of staff to Biden, and all these folks, you know, that the ExxonMobil uh, lobbyist who was uh, caught by our friends at Greenpeace uh, on the Zoom saying, oh, we can get this guy, that guy, that's how we're going to win this thing. You know, and it's the same people, by the way, I think you would, you would be uh, <laughs> connecting the dots here. Uh, Joe Sandberg has been advocating since I started talking to him way before that for a $25 minimum wage. People who voted on the Democratic side, and Republicans don't count because they, they're all against it, uh, Manchin, uh, Mr. Uh, Cinema, uh, with their famous thumbs down, uh, the uh, senator from Tester, from, uh, from our friends in uh, Montana, uh, Hassan in New Hampshire, same people, Joe Sandberg, same people that are, are, are basically the lobbying, uh, the goals for this lobbyist at Exxon to stop climate change. There you go. Well, one of the reasons that the oil industry has profited over the last decade is it depends on subjugating workers into subsistent wages. Not only has the oil industry crushed our planet, it's impoverished its workforce. So I'm not surprised to hear that. No doubt. All right, let's go to the phones. We uh, uh, talked with uh, um, a couple of people uh, last uh, segment. So I'm going to start with John. Uh, you are next with Joe Sandberg. Go right ahead, John, in Minneapolis. Yeah, uh, another thing to add is that the oil industry gets a huge uh, subsidy uh, and tax, uh, you know, relief from the federal government to do all of that at, while they're heating up our climate and actually even destroying the very infrastructure of our life, you know, that our life depends on. And uh, this this is really absurd, you know. And then, uh, you know, the... The oil that is, uh, you know, coming from this tar sands is going to be going to one of the largest, most pristine uh, sources of, uh, of water, of clean water, uh, Lake Superior. I, I was kidding with my brother. I said, yeah, and then they're going to get a, a pipeline to send out west, you know, going the other direction. I mean, this is ridiculous because, you know, I, I'm running my house completely off of solar and I have no solar panels. It's from a solar farm, and then it's a company, uh, startup company in Colorado, and I'm actually, my, my uh, electric bills are much cheaper than uh, XL Energy, which is a, a Houston-based uh, Texas uh, energy company. But what I wanted to talk about as far as homelessness is that, uh, you know, the financialization, the real estate market, 
and the development of real estate is so tempting to city officials. We, I, I think I mentioned this last time, 3,000 units were built in this, uh, in just this one section of, of Minneapolis and Northeast Minneapolis, which is not very big. And, uh, you know, only about 200 of them are actually, you know, low cost uh, housing. And, uh, you know, Rob Scott brings this up all the time, or I bring it up about homelessness and the economy. And one of the problems is uh, relating to, uh, David K, I mean, uh, Harvey K's uh, um, spot here just previously. Uh, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, during the depression, because I know he's a, a big, you know, big, um, historian of FDR, you know, it, 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 unemployment was, you know, through the roof, like 50, 40, 50% in some places. And so people had more empathy for, uh, you know, for the homeless. And I don't see that here, uh, really, in this, uh, you know, this kind of market, in in this kind of economy, yeah. political yeah, no. economy. Because, there, there yeah. isn't. There isn't, there, unfortunately, there John. There isn't, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, John, for the call. Uh, Joe? Well, I think that that's true. I think it's also true that a lot of hardworking people are paying a lot of taxes, and they see almost a billion dollars going to the city of Los Angeles. And they wonder why the hell isn't the set of results better? Like, let's be real. A billion dollars should be enough to address the homelessness issue in Los Angeles. If it's not, I'm all for raising taxes. But it's a re- real question to ask. Where the hell is the money going? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who, is, the, who is making this? Is gravy train after gravy train for political individuals in L.A. County and L.A. City yeah. and, of course, in Sacramento. Uh, and, and, and they are getting contracts to their buddies, and that's the payback in the campaign. It goes on and yeah. on and on. And, yeah, you know, I want, I'm really glad you raised that. I want our listeners to really hear this. I've seen, I've seen how this works. What happens is there's consultants who take a fee on yep. figuring out who should do the work. And then the people who do the work take a fee on subcontracting the work out to someone else. And so by the time you end up with actually helping people, the the nearly billion dollars becomes something much less than that because all these people have fed at the trough of these government contracts that don't have sufficient oversight, that aren't properly properly scrutinized by journalists and the media because the media has been crushed by consolidation and and the, the tech monopolies and so that's what's happening people are and, and by the way, people are understandably pissed you know i think we need to understand that you can both want more government and you can want to hold government accountable for where the hell it's spending your money i agree yeah, I mean, you know, good government is not democratic only government. You know, there are plenty of corrupt Democrats. I've only voted once for a Republican in my entire life. Why? Because the guy who was the, I think, the lottery commissioner was was corrupt as can be, was being indicted. So I had no other choice. You either vote for a guy who's about to be indicted, who happened to be, I have a D next to his name, or the Republican. You know, I mean, it, it this this to me has nothing to do with party. It has completely to do with people who want good government, who care about their fellow human beings, not their fellow wallets, which they all you know tend to enhance once they leave office. Yes. Uh, you're right. spot on, uh, Joe. Uh, let's go to somebody in Florida who has been talking about homelessness issues on this show. Our good friend Peter, you are next with Joe Sandberg. Go right ahead, Peter. Hey, man, thanks for having him on, and thanks for educating me on Gavin Newsom getting, uh, being the number one recipient of, uh, you know, healthcare big pharma money. Yeah. Uh, now, Joe, the question, that, the question that I have is, when he does that, that also means that all your network news people during an election cycle will be juiced by the healthcare department. To yeah. make sure that they don't cover any problems with health insurance or prescription drugs or the EpiPen. You know, we got to figure out a way to put them on edge. Uh, I agree. This is really important. We have to get my... back to talking about campaign finance reform. Somewhere along the last five years, our movement stopped demanding campaign finance reform. But it is true that we cannot get to these other issues until we have campaign finance reform. Otherwise, you're always going to be pushing up a boulder, a boulder up against a huge hill where 
the insurance industry, pick your industry, is greasing the skids of the media yep. that depends on advertising. It's not, you know, look, I, I'm empathetic. The people who are working in the media, they need to earn a living and support their family. And oh, yeah. the way they earn a living is through the advertisements that their networks make. And that advertising dollars comes from these corrupt industries. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah, a I mean, bad and, and, endless and, cycle. And, Go ahead, Peter. And, and and I'm just saying that big farm and the health insurance will pay top dollar during an election year for commercials to make sure that the news doesn't cover all the the disaster that we're in. And I understand, right. Joe, what you're saying about campaign finance problem, but we do got to realize. You know, the Democrats and the Republicans have more in common with the Crips and Bloods than I care, than I wish. <laughs> right now, I'm a Democrat. I'm blue, I'm a blood. But I know that the leadership is getting juiced by corrupt campaign money, just like the Republicans. I mean, yep, yep. insider trading in the stock market, Nancy Pelosi's famous for it. I mean, it's no secret, it's just that the network news won't cover it. Well, yeah, and I mean, exactly. We fight. I mean, I, I, no, you're, I just you're spot want to on, add Peter. One thing to Joe, and, and I, and I, I didn't know if this is true or not. I heard that on the COVID deaths, thirty percent of the COVID deaths can be attributed to people without health care that got so sick that they didn't want to come in when they could have saved them. Now, yeah, I'm just so curious true. if that's true or why. Wouldn't be surprising. Th- this is what you we think are. if they're we homeless, the there you go. Third world. Yeah. Well, like I said, we're looking more like Jamaican or the Dominican Republic every day. And I think what we ought to do is shame ourselves. But then I we agree. ignore it. You know, you see so many homeless people. Hey, take care, man. Love the show. Great guest as always, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. You're a great caller. Uh, before we take the next call, uh, I, I just think, uh, Joe, that it is incredibly important, uh, you know, to, to speak truth to power all the time. And you do that. We try to do that on this show. We, we you know, we allow a lot of listeners to s- state their views, and they all come from different walks of life in different states. And, and this, this is, to me, you know, where you need uh, America to grow. And that, that average middle American who, you know, watches, uh, you know, sports or reality TV or whatever they want to watch to sort of get away from things have to stop saying, I got to get engaged. I got to get involved because too many people are making my world, my kids' world more problematic. And I can't just stand by here and continue to let it happen. So I, I think that, uh, that's where we need to head and why we need people like you. Let's go to San Francisco. Talk to our good friend, Mark in uh, San Francisco by the Bay. You're next with Joe Sandberg. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, gentlemen, I think we have to link um, health care uh, with homelessness because there's a lot of uh, what I see homeless people that are me- mentally cha- uh, ch- challenged, and uh, they-, they never got help or care and were thrown out in the street. So a lot of the homeless are, are people that need to be in a home and taken care of, and they're not. They're being thrown to the wolves uh, and uh, I think we need to link the two together. Well, I yeah, agree. Of course, you're right, Joe. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's birth to death that we have to take care of people. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, 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 I know that we are usually talking about the American uh, uh, system here. But when I see, and you know, this is right up your alley, when I see the folks in Denmark working at McDonald's make $22 an hour, and here in America it's $10 an hour, I'm going out of my mind. We have to tell the American people that other people are doing this. A lot of them, they stole it from FDR and a lot of the ideas. And, you know, again, this is something that the American media has to do a compare and contrast. It's not that hard. In Washington, D.C., you can get any press person from all the embassies that are there put them on and say this is what we do in, in berlin this is what we do in paris you know and this is what we do in london not that hard uh you know just a, a comparison perspective here um i just think that you know california can set a lot of standards like new york there's a lot of media there joe and uh, again if, if you were to win it could move an agenda uh, a progressive agenda that Bernie started and others are trying to emulate AOC and others. And to me, that's where we need to go. I don't think there's any other avenue here that we can we can go for. It just has to happen. Your final thoughts. You're right. We're running out of time. 
the next 10 years, I think, are going to be determinative of whether this planet is even inhabitable and whether we're going to pass the point of no return on our democracy. Yeah. Well, it's 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 where we're at right now, and at, uh, it is uh, the time is uh, ticking. Joe Sandberg again, co-founder of Aspiration dot com. You can go to Aspiration dot com forward slash Revolution. Please do uh, like our good friend Mark just called us is a uh, member uh, of Aspiration dot com. Uh, Joe, thank you. Have a great weekend, my friend. Happy Fourth of July. Thank you. We'll be right back with uh, Mark Taylor Canfield. We'll talk to Rudy then as well. He's got something to say about what's happening in the 206. It is the Jeff Santos Show. We'll be right back after this commercial timeout. <laughs> 